are, we are in this series, Rebuild, and we've been journeying through the book of Nehemiah, specifically Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, we say Ezra is included in this because in the original writings of this book, this was all uh, one book all together. And so we are now in the last installment of Nehemiah, and I want our attention to be drawn uh, to the text this morning because Nehemiah is going to give us an overview of how you and I as believers can continue to overcome distractions. And so if you have uh, anything to take notes with, this is a phenomenal sermon to take notes uh, on. I always encourage that, but this Sunday more specifically. Uh, but, but before we dive in, I want to say a word of prayer, and then we'll get caught up. Father, we love you. We thank you that you are good. We thank you, Father, that every single Sunday that we come together, we can gather around your word. And God, I just pray that we would press pause, we would remove distractions from our mind, and I pray, Father, that we would pay attention to what you have to say to us this morning. I pray, Father, that your word would remain true, and I pray that you would use me to speak clearly and effectively this message. God, anything that's distracting, I pray, would be removed, and I pray only truth would remain. Father, would you continue to change us as we look to your word to see what it looks like for us to be spiritually revived. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I want to start out talking about UAVs. Y'all know what a UAV is? All of those who play Call of Duty know what a UAV is, but you probably don't know what an actual UAV is. But there is some interesting history to UAVs. In fact, all throughout history we see these particular unmanned uh, aircrafts actually give a huge advantage into particular wars. Now, before technology was developed, there was different ways that people would go about gaining insight on the enemy. Sometimes they would use uh, balloons or parachutes that would drop in. And then the British Army actually got a little bit sophisticated and they started utilizing cameras and the cameras would take aerial photos of the enemy territory so that they could strategically plan their attack and they could see where the enemy was most fortified. But if you fast forward to the mid-1980s to the mid-90s, there is a particular man named Abraham. Uh, let me find his name here real quick. Abraham Kareem, excuse me. Abraham Kareem, he came in on a joint project with the U.S. and Israeli, and he came up with the Nat 750. Everyone say Nat 750. This was a sophisticated piece, uh, a sophisticated drone. The reason being is that this drone had cameras that were built onto it, not just pho photography, but video. And so this drone could fly over. In fact, this is what helped the assault on Osama bin Laden back when we utilized these predators. But these particular drones would fly over. And what made them so unique was the fact that they could stay in the sky for so long. You see, all of the other methods of strategic planning required for somebody to go up in the air or some kind of refueling process, but these particular drones could stay in the air for an extensive amount of time, some up to 12 hours, and they could cover up to a 60-mile radius, giving the people utilizing the intel a very strategic upper hand. I tell you that this morning because Nehemiah is going to give us a very strategic upper hand on how to get on the inside of how the enemy attacks us. And specifically for you and I, as we are journeying through this, I want all of us to be a people who are being spiritually renewed. Before we ever see a great revival happen, not only here in this house, but across the churches in America today, something has to happen in the people of God. Spiritual renewal needs to take place. For far too long, we've moved away from the patterns and the behaviors that Christ has laid out for us, and we've been attacked left and right by the enemy. But in order for us to come back into a new season, in order for us to find some new terrain for us to conquer, you and I have to be a people who understand how the enemy attacks. And Nehemiah is going to give us a very clear picture and an overview of how the enemy comes against us when we start taking steps towards spiritual renewal. 
I can tell you this this morning, that the moment you step into an arena of spiritual renewal, the moment you start adding some spiritual disciplines to your life, you can bet that you're going to face opposition. You're going to face opposition. Most of us don't understand what that opposition feels like because we're actually not moving in the right direction, spiritually speaking. If you're not doing anything about your spiritual life, then why in the world does the enemy have to worry about what you're doing? Why does he have to throw an attack your way? But the moment you realize when you start stepping towards spiritual things and you start laying out some disciplines in your life and you start building this spiritual renewal in your heart and in your life, you're going to be faced with opposition. And Nehemiah gives us a clear picture on how to face this opposition. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Nehemiah chapter 4. and We're going to literally cover the entire uh, chapter of chapter 4, starting with verse 3, or 1, excuse me. It says this. It'll be up on the screen for you. If you have your Bibles, turn there. Get your phones. Turn them on. It says this. Now, when Sanballat heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they receive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what are they building? He's trying to give them throw a bunch of shade on the work that they're doing. He says, if a fox goes up, On it, he will break down their stone wall. Remember that in this text, we have Nehemiah who has patiently prayed, who has actively sought the counsel of God, who has gotten permission from the king to now move towards rebuilding the wall. And we've gone through three major pivots throughout the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. Remember, Zerubbabel went back and he first laid down the foundation. Then Ezra moved in and he brought the people around the scripture of God and rebuilt the temple. But now we have Nehemiah moving to rebuild the wall and they are faced with opposition right off the start. Can I tell you this morning, the moment you start moving towards spiritual disciplines in your life, the first thing that the enemy is going to do to try to attack you is prevent you from even starting. This is where a lot of Christians really find themselves. If we're being really honest, Nehemiah is in the middle of rebuilding the walls and all of a sudden they get outside opposition and they begin to taunt them. In other words, what they are trying to get them to see is the overwhelming amount of work that's before them and discourage them completely from even beginning the project. Many of us in our spiritual lives are so overwhelmed at the work that has to take place that we don't even start it. And all the wives in the house understand the household project that hasn't gotten done because it is too overwhelming. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Any husbands in the house have a household project that's a little too overwhelming? You just look at the project, you think to yourself, that looks like too much work, I'm not touching the garage, I'm going to go watch some football, right? That's what we do with our spiritual lives. We get to this place where we see the overwhelming amount of work that it would take for us to accomplish what God is calling us to, so instead of even starting, we just completely bypass it entirely. We just say to ourselves, it's not even worth putting up the fight. There are far too many Christians right now who are sitting on the sidelines of what God has called them to do because they're looking in on what is happening and they're thinking this is too much to handle. Satan will always try to prevent you from even starting the process. He'll get you to a point where you're so incredibly incredibly discouraged that he gets you to look around at all of the issues that are happening and he says it's not even worth starting. Some of you feel this because of your past and you think of the brokenness that you've come out of. You think of the hurt that you've experienced in your past and Satan is looking at you trying to attack you saying it's not even worth your time and your energy because nobody even really wants you. 
You see, if the enemy can come in and discourage you from the start, he can get you to completely stop moving towards what God has called you to do. And Nehemiah faces this opposition right off the bat. And I want you to understand that in your spiritual journey, as we begin to look at what it, what it looks like for us to be a people who are setting up spiritual disciplines in our life, I want you to understand that you need to have some courage to start. That it may not be a perfect start. It may not be you setting up every single goal and you acing every single goal. But you got to start somewhere. Otherwise, you'll sit on the sidelines too discouraged from even entering the game. But let's look at what Nehemiah does and says. If you continue on in the text, we see him respond. And just in Nehemiah's fashion, he responds with prayer. He says, hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in the land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let their sin be blotted out and not let their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. And verse 6, so we built the wall and the wall and all the wall was joined together at half its height. For the people had a mind to work. In order for you to understand how to overcome just beginning to start, you have to have a resolve in your heart and your mind that you're just going to start. This isn't like a bootstrap faith where you just try to put yourself, pull yourself up by your own words. You're like, I got to do this. But can I be really honest? Sometimes, just sometimes, there comes a point where you have to take a hard look in the mirror and realize that there are some things that you're doing that are not bringing life to you, but they're actually causing destruction to you. And you need to set it in your heart and in your mind to have resolve to get those things out of your life. Nehemiah is showing us how to get over the fact that sometimes the enemy will keep us from starting, but he's saying they had a mind to work. What's your mind set on? If your mind is set on the discouragement that the enemy is trying to bring to you, you'll never start. But if you can learn how to begin to navigate the lies of the enemy and understand that there's an attack upon you, you can then begin to put one foot in front of the other and begin to start the process. Because ultimately, if he can't cause you to not start, then he will bring, number two, discouragement to your heart. You're like, well, aren't these two the same thing? Let's pay attention to verse 10 very carefully here. All the way through 23, big chunk of text here. It says this, In Judah it was said that the strength of those who bear with the burden is failing. They're growing tired. There's too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At the time the Jews said who had lived near them, came from all directions and said to us, ten times you must return to us. Ten times over. Underline that in your Bibles. So in the lowest parts of the wall, the space between the wall and open places, breaches in other words in the wall, I stationed people, Nehemiah, stationed people by their clans with their swords, their spear, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leader stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried the burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and each held a weapon in the other hand. And each of the builders had a sword strapped to his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. 
And he said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread and we are separated on the wall far from one another. And the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet rally to us there and our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work and half of them held spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at the time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem that they may be on guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor servants or the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. If the enemy can't keep you from starting the process, he will discourage your heart to the point of you not beginning to move towards what God is calling you to do. What he does is he identifies the breach points in your life. Notice what Nehemiah did in that entire body of text right there. There's a lot that he laid out for us. He laid out the fact that not only has he identified the breach points, but he gave each worker a sword and he gave each worker a trowel, which was, well, it's a little spatula for builders, okay, if you don't know what a trowel looks like. And he says, you're going to go to work. He says, the work is overwhelming, but all of the people were spread out on the walls. They were completely isolated at this point. And what they were doing was they were beginning to rebuild the gates. We can look back in Nehemiah chapter 3 where all of the gates were being rebuilt. In the text, it's beautiful. It said next to them, next to them, next to them. Repeatedly, time after time, how the people were rebuilding the walls. But Nehemiah had them specifically positioned at each one of the breaches. This is how the enemy comes into our lives. He comes into our lives through the breaches of our lives, through the sins and the wounds that we have inflicted upon ourselves or have been inflicted upon us by other people. Understand me right now that when the enemy attacks, he's going to try to prevent you from starting, but he's going to discourage your heart through the breaches. Do you understand that sometimes there are sin... Uh, Areas in our life where the enemy loves to take a hold of. I need you to pay very close attention for a moment and do a survey of your heart and in your life. When I mention the word sin, there's something that pops up in your heart. It's like saying unicorn. You can't help but think of a unicorn. When I say sin, there's something that bubbles up to the surface. For some of you, you might feel a little bit uncomfortable because you're thinking of the secret sin that you're tucking away in your life right now. For others of you, you're thinking about the sin that was afflicted upon you that has caused a gaping wound in your life that has never healed. Please hear me. Wounds need to heal. Scars are one thing. Scars are beautiful reminders that where there once was an open wound, healing has occurred. But for many Christians, there are wounds that are gashed open that we think have actually healed and they haven't. Causing the enemy to come in at a breach point in our lives, attacking us, whether that's, being, that's mentally because he has some form of insecurity that you're dealing with and you just can't seem to get over, or he's coming to you through your sin. And you start to tell yourself that the work is too overwhelming. You start to begin to lie to yourself thinking about the anger that you deal with and you say, my dad was always angry, so I guess I'm going to be angry as well. You start thinking about the lust that be, might be in your life and you start thinking about how you're dealing with it and you've dealt with it for so long and you're thinking to yourself, I'm probably really never going to get over this. You see, there's breach points in our lives where the enemy comes in to attack but I want you to notice how incredibly practical Nehemiah gets. If you're asking yourself the question, what are your breach points? Look to your sins and look to your wounds. That's where the enemy is coming to attack. But then what do you do about those breach points? You get incredibly practical like Nehemiah did. Do you hear his game plan? He lays out guards and he lays out workers. Not only are there workers... Uh, working with the trowel, but they're also working with a sword. This means that they're building up the wall, but they're also battling at the same time. This is exactly the posture of the life of a believer. Please hear me. For some of you, the breach has been down for so long because you've lacked the practical applications that you need to build the wall back up to protect you in your life. 
Let me say it this way. A lot of people deal with sin. But a lot of people do not like to self-examine. They don't like to self-examine to the point of asking themselves, what do I need to do to fix the breach? And so many of us, in the doctrine of grace, we begin to run wild, allowing grace to abound and saying, God, thank you for your grace, morning after morning after morning, while not doing anything about the sin that's running rampant in your life. And you say, God's grace is going to cover. Paul very specifically says, grace should not abound so that we might sin more. What we need to be as believers in this new season We need to be people who are at the wall building, but are battle ready at the same time. Uh, Charles Spurgeon named his magazine The Sword and the Trowel. And I know the trowel is really a, a, a word that we don't really use nowadays, or if you're not in that industry, you don't know really what that looks like, but really, it's literally like a spatula. It's this little triangle piece. Y'all know what, I, you know what it looks like now? Okay, good. I didn't know what it was. That's why I'm making sure you knew what it was. <laughs> and he says, in one hand, we have to be a people who have the sword ready to attack the enemy when the enemy comes at us. But at the same time, we're building up spiritual disciplines in our lives so that we can continue to mature and look more like Christ. How are we supposed to represent Christ well if we are not being a people who are busy building at spiritual disciplines in our life? When the people who are far from God look at Christians nowadays, they're just looking at a bunch of people who don't know how to stand up for what they believe in. And it's because we've dropped the trowel, we've dropped the sword, and we're like, yeah, I believe in Christ. And we're completely defenseless to the attacks of the enemy. It's a hard tension, and it's a hard word to hear, but please hear me this morning. I believe so strongly that God in this next season, coming out of all that we've just endured, of being separated and isolated, if we have not learned how to pick up the sword and the trowel, if we not, have not learned how to be a people who both build and battle at the same time, it's going to be an even more difficult season ahead. Christ is looking for believers who are equipped with this. Can I just tell you that it is hard, that it is difficult, but we need to be a people who have disciplines building and battling at the same time. Building and battling at the same time. Here's two points that I want to point out from this as a sub-point. You weren't meant to fight alone. Did you notice that they were completely separated all around the wall? They did it strategically because they were rebuilding particular breaches, but Nehemiah saw because of how separated that they were that it wasn't good for them to be that separated. So he puts them back together in their households and in their clans so that they could be together. And he specifically put a trumpet person with him. So if there was a moment of an attack, they could blow the trumpet and all of the people could rush to the attack point. You are not meant to fight your sin alone. You are not meant to fight as a disciple alone. You are meant to be in community together. And right now, I believe the enemy is set like, a, like an assault, like a, a marine sniper picking off Christians one by one as people are completely isolated and completely disconnected from community in this season. And God is saying, it's time for us to come back together so that we can be the family who fights together. You were never meant to overcome that by yourself. We fight together, battle ready and building at the same time. People coming together. And then secondly, you see that not only were the people coming together to fight together, but you have to be a people who are continuing to build and battle These are the two main pieces for us to understand as we continue to navigate what it looks like for us to have spiritual revitalization in our hearts and in our lives. So ask yourself the question, are you discouraged this morning? And if you are, then what's the breach point in your life? And what disciplines are you going to set up so that those breaches can be, begin to be built back up again? For some of you returning, this is a great opportunity I see some new faces and faces coming back. 
Listen, just starting the healthy habit of showing up to church every week is a great place to start. I was talking to some of our serve teams. I said the difficult tension of this season for churches across America right now where church attendance was already driving down and people were only coming to church maybe once to three times, three times a month, or once to twice a month, excuse me, where there was a crack in the value system of people asking, is this really valuable to me, has now been exposed with six months of not attending church. And so because it was never high on the value system for people, returning back together again is increasingly difficult. So it's a new season. It's a, it's a new chapter for the church. Are we going to be a people who are battle ready and who are building together? Continuing on, we see that Nehemiah makes this charge. And if the enemy is going to attack you. He's going to prevent you. He's going to try to prevent you. He's going to try to discourage your heart. And then he's going to try to divert your attention. Honestly, for most of us in here right now, you may not have a discouraged heart. And for a lot of you in here right now, you may not be the person who is, who is stopped on the starting part. In fact, I would say most of y'all are here because you're starting again. But I think that there's one thing that all of us struggle with, and that is our attention being diverted. If we hop over to chapter 6, we see Nehemiah, verses 1 through 4. It says this, I'll give you a second to get there. He begins to talk about how the wall was built up to where there was no breach, Nehemiah. And he says, although at the time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem said to me, Come and let us meet together at Hakafrim in the plain in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to saying, saying to them, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they said it to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. Do you see the repetition not only in chapter six, but also in chapter four? where they sent word ten times, and at this time they sent words four times. The enemy loves to repeat the same plan over and over and over and over again, uh, causing us to slowly break down mentally. And he says to them, he is doing a good work, so why should I go down to them? He knew his harm. This particular plane was filled with apparently lions, so it was not a good field to go to. I don't know why they were like, hey, you come to the field of lions to hang out with us. It'll be a good time. Like, automatically, that's a red flag, and they knew it was a trap. Nehemiah knew it was a trap. And he says, hey, I'm not going to come down to you, but what were they trying to do? They were trying to divert the attention away from the working of the wall, the good thing that Nehemiah was doing. Can I tell you, for most of us, in regards to building and battling in our spiritual lives, we're not struggling with starting. Most of us may not be struggling with being discouraged, but a lot of us are, are struggling from being diverted in our attention. We're just simply distracted. Your attention span has tuned me out like a lot already in my sermon. You have the attention span less than a goldfish. We, I say you, we. Did you know that? That's shocking. You're like, is that real? Some of you are like, uh, my attention span, is it more than a goldfish? No, Google's going to tell you no. We're distracted people. We are so distracted with busyness that we don't even know how to get anything done anymore. In regards to our spiritual life, the breaches are gaping in the walls in our life because we are so distracted by everything around us that we're being diverted away from the good work that Christ has called us to. Please hear me this morning. Nehemiah understood that this was a lure away from, the, from his good work, that the enemy was trying to get him to stop doing what God had called him to do. And so what he will always do is divert your attention. He will begin to distract you. What has your attention has your devotion. Have you thought about that? You probably give God 
the weekend hours. For some of you, you give God your group hours. You're there on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. But for a lot of us, after this, there is no attention to the things of God. There's no attention to his word. There's no attention to his scriptures. There's no attention to prayer. There's no devotion because our attention is being pulled in so many different directions. And there's so many different distractions. And can I be really honest with you? The distractions are oftentimes very good things. This is where most of us struggle. Satan doesn't come at us with something that is bad. I mean, look at the first play in Genesis, when he approached Eve, he approached Eve with something that was desirable and that was good. He does the same thing to you and I. He approaches us with things that are desirable and good. And it's just all a distraction to get us away from beginning to mature into the believer that we are called to be. Uh, I'll be really honest, I, I try not to harp on technology, technology that much. I really try not to. But because we live in the digital age, it's important for me to address these things. Listen, this is a phenomenal tool. I use it all the time, probably too much to the point in my sermon. Phenomenal tool. Uh, but have anybody, has anybody watched The Social Dilemma yet on Netflix? And some of y'all are like, I shouldn't say Netflix because some of y'all are like, I've already canceled it and that's a hot topic, triggered word, I apologize. But if you still have it and you're seeing the social dilemma, social dilemma literally talks about the algorithm that I've preached to you for literally a long time. So you're welcome, okay? Uh, for all those who've been attending Wake for like four years, I've been telling you about the algorithm for a long time, this artificial intelligence that's existing. Well, with the, with the documentary exposes from people who are the former heads of like companies like Pinterest and Snapchat, uh, Instagram, Facebook, these people who built the machine that we all are paying so very close attention to on a daily basis literally tell their families not to have the account that they built because they understand the algorithm and they understand the damage that it causes to them socially. But what the social dilemma exposes for us is that there is an algorithm that is constantly playing in the background of our lives and this phone is just simply meant to distract us. Did you know, just for a second, did you know that they have people who have studied the behavior of how you act? Why do you think, simple point, and they say it in the documentary, but why do you think every time you get a notification on your phone, they don't put the full notification on there? You ever notice this? You're like, oh my gosh. Some of y'all are like, <laughs> you're welcome. Sermon over. We'll see you next week. But that's literally what they do. They don't put the full notification on it. Why? Because it is designed for you to see your phone light up. I have three notifications on my phone right now. And everything within me wants to actually tap on it and see what those notifications are. Because every single time you make a tap, you're shooting a, a, a small amount of dopamine to your brain. This is not just a tool. This is an addictive device. And every single time you open it up, it is distracting you. Listen, you are being discipled more by technology than you are by the word of God. Because we pick this up far more than we ever pick up our Bibles. And if you don't believe me, pay attention to your screen time, which is so incredibly hard to look at. You know why? Every single time I review my screen time, I get so angry at myself. Every single time. Even on the weeks that I thought I did good. I still spent somehow eight hours on my phone. It's crazy. That's, that's, that's like low. There's some, some weeks, I'm a graphic designer on the side, so I am in front of my computer a lot. If you're thinking to yourself, like, that's weird. That's literally my vocation on the side. But I'm in front of my computer a lot, and sometimes those numbers are skyrocketing. And the reason why it's so heartbreaking is I think to myself, I just took eight hours away from my family. I took eight hours away from my devotion time with God. I promise you, people say all the time that they don't have time for God and spiritual disciplines. You are being deceived. Your phone tells you that you have time. As a self-evaluation, 
when you leave this service or in the middle of my message or at the reflection time, look at your screen time. Ask yourself how many hours a week you've spent on your devices. And you'll magically find time for the gym. You'll magically find time for your family again. You'll magically find time for the things of God again. The greatest ploy of the enemy is to simply distract us. And I'm not here saying like, oh man, that's, that's cool, Josh. Like I know you talk about the algorithm and all that all the time. I get it, man. That's cool. But I, you know, that's my, that's my livelihood. I get it. It's my livelihood. I get it. But if we don't self-evaluate, I, I just, I wish, I wish, honest to God, they need to develop, Wade, I know you're out there, we need to develop this tool to go along with seminary. I wish that there was a way to evaluate screen time for the word of God. I wish, I wish, because I could evaluate my week so much better. How much time did I spend in God's word? Did I spend eight hours? Did I spend ten hours? I we have to reevaluate because what the enemy is doing to us right now is he, he's getting us to the place where we're so distracted that we can't focus to what, on what God is calling us to do. And then our families are suffering because we think we don't have enough time. Your job performance could be suffering because you're so distracted by social media. You're suffering from a community standpoint, please hear me in a politically charged era right now, you're suffering because you cannot have a legitimate conversation with someone who doesn't have the same views as you because you have suffered the algorithm where it literally puts in front of you anything that you want to be truth, even though it might be fake news. It is causing fractures and divisions among all of us from a church standpoint, from a nation standpoint, to your family, it is causing fractures because Satan is simply distracting us. So continuing on, I gotta hurry. Two more things, two more things. We'll, we'll breeze through these. Number four, he'll twist the truth. If he, can't, if he can't prevent you from starting, if he begins to discourage your heart, He'll try to divert your attention and then he'll try to twist the truth. Nehemiah 6, verse 5 and verse uh, through 8. And I'll pick up, uh, let me pick up mid part. He says, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to, to rebel. That is why you are rebuilding the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And he says, And you also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah, and now the king will hear these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. Then I said to him, saying, No such thing as you have said have I done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. If Satan can't get you completely distracted, then he'll get you off of your path by twisting the truth. Nehemiah was making sure that he said back to them that what you are saying has been completely made up. Once again, if we go all the way back to the very beginning, we see Satan doing this to Eve. He said, did God really say? Satan has been in the business of twisting truth since day one. And he'll stop you from moving forward towards spiritual renewal in your life because he'll just spam you with fake news all day long. And I'm not talking about the fake news on your news feed. I'm talking about the fake news saying that you can't trust God. The fake news that says, is there really a God? The fake news that comes to you and begins to open up the, uh, the, the doubt in your life and crack it open in such a way that causes you not to move forward towards the things of God. That causes you to, to back away. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with young adults who are struggling with their doubts because the truth is so twisted. And they're struggling to find their way because culture says you can follow Christ however you want to follow Christ. There's a song out by Laney. It says, I still talk to Jesus. The lyrics... For all of those who listen to Laney, some of you are like, I have no idea who that is. Super hipster band, 
Phil showed them to me, the, the young hipster. That, you're not Phil. It's okay. Um, <laughs> he would have been there. <laughs> Super hipster band. And there's a song that they just released on their new album that says, I still talk to Jesus. And the lyrics on this song, one, are so incredibly sad because I know how incredibly true they are. The lyrics talk about how I still talk to Jesus, but I still go to the club. I still go do whatever I want to do. I still have the line if I want to have the line. I still go and do all of these things, but it's okay because I still talk to Jesus. And can I tell you the state of a generation is right there in that point. I can do whatever I want to do because there's not absolute truth. So I'll still talk to Jesus on the weekend. I'll come to church. I'll raise my hand. I'll sing a song. I'll check my kids in to wake kids and I'll check out and that's it because I still talk to Jesus. But Monday through Saturday, don't, don't come talk to me about my activity because my activity, that's for me. And I can do what I want to do as long as I still talk to Jesus. Friends, can I tell you that is the furthest thing from the truth. Christ tells us very clearly that there are going to be people who say with their lips that they know him, but their hearts are far from him. And a generation that says, it's okay, I can do whatever I want to do because truth doesn't exist. I'm here to tell you, friends, that truth does exist. His name is Jesus, and he is the only way. You can like it or you can dislike it, but you're not going to get around the man named Jesus. And so Satan will come in and say, ah, no, nah, is that really true? He'll try to twist the truth on you. And if he can twist the truth on you, then you can disengage. Because what's the point of engaging if none of this is even real? Lastly, he'll try to get you to compromise your character. Nehemiah 6, once again, 10 through 12, wrapping up right here with these last text. He says, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us choose or let us close the doors, doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. And he says, I understood and saw that God had not sent him. But he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. This is how deceptive Tobiah and Sanballat were to Nehemiah. They went and hired a prophet to go speak to Nehemiah. And what the prophet ordered Nehemiah or prophesied to Nehemiah, he said, hey, go into the temple. Remember, Nehemiah was a man of the word. He studied the scriptures. He understood that he was not a man who could enter into the temple. He was merely a cupbearer. Entering into the temple was reserved for those Levites, for the priests who could go into the temple. And so what they were trying to do was trick Nehemiah to go in, and they were trying to discredit Nehemiah because this would remove him from his position. Can I tell you right now that the last thing that the enemy will try to do to you to attack you is he'll chip away at your character. He'll cause you to try to compromise your character. If he can't prevent you from starting, if he can't discourage you, if he can't get your attention distracted, and if he can't begin to uh, twist the truth on you, he will get you to the point where you begin to try to compromise your character. Christ has called us to live lives of integrity. And some of, some of us are struggling with the compromise of character because you're struggling with infidelity. He'll chip away at your character. You're struggling with sin that is repeated over and over and over again. You might be an employer in the house and you keep cutting corners and corners and corners, chipping away at your character. Your character is incredibly important. Your character should reflect Christ. And if your character is gone, if who you are is gone because of the sin that's in your life, we struggle then to reflect Christ well. 
I've told you before, but the Titanic sank because the lower half of the boat was divided up. It was divided up and the thought process from the engineers is that if we divide up the bottom of the boat, that if there was an entry point into the boat, then only one section of the boat would fill up. It was a good thought process. Unfortunately, an application, it caused the Titanic to sink twice as fast. A life is never meant to be divided up. Men, your life is not meant to be a life that is led in secrecy. Secrecy kills intimacy. Can I just, can I just step on some toes for a moment? Your wife and your husband should have the passcode to your phone. I don't know where this idea of being so secretive has come into our culture where wives and husbands don't share their phone passcodes and their device passcodes and they chalk it up to trust and they start throwing the argument, oh, you don't trust me? No, 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 my friend. You are not living in integrity. Integrity means that you can be who you are in front of everybody because your life is completely exposed. There's nothing to hide. Secrecy will always kill intimacy. And the enemy will come in as a breach point because you've kept your life secret to your spouse. Don't do that. It's a breach point. Be completely exposed. Being loved is being fully known and fully loved. That requires complete openness. So don't be like the Titanic, divided up. And you can feel it in your life when you're divided up. You know why? You'll be exhausted. You'll be exhausted from covering up your tracks of a divided life. So if you're weary and you're tired, it might be because your character is taking a hit and there's a breach point there. So where is the enemy attacking you this morning? Because I'm telling you right now, friends, the enemy is attacking the people of God. And the people of God, if we're not paying attention, are going to be picked off one by one. Spiritual renewal has to start in your heart and in your life first. If we're ever going to see people who are far from God come into this house and experience life transformation, it's got to start in our hearts. We cannot expect for that to happen if it hasn't first happened in our hearts. So ask yourself the question, where is the enemy attacking you? Is he preventing you from starting this morning? Is he discouraging your heart? Is he diverting your attention? Is he twisting the truth? Or is he compromising your character? The beautiful news of the gospel, friends, is that we have a greater Nehemiah. Understand me, that Nehemiah went to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And if we look ahead in the New Testament, we see the beautiful king of kings not come in on a horse, but ride in into the city of Jerusalem humbly on a donkey. This king of kings, who was, in fact, had status in heaven, left his status to come be with us. And not only does this king come, but this king came humbly. He put all of our sin on his back. He took it to the cross, and he buried our sin in the grave. The greatest breach point of the enemy where the enemy thought that he had defeated Jesus, Jesus turned into the greatest victory for mankind. And from it, now he has provided us life, he has given us freedom, and he's provided the Holy Spirit so that our lives can be empowered to be people who rise together, who battle, and who build. This is the king that we serve. The good news is, at the end of Nehemiah, unfortunately, the walls were rebuilt, they had a celebration, but the people fell through on their commitment to the Father. We needed Jesus to come. We needed a greater Nehemiah, and he's here. So if you're experiencing those kinds of things in your life, good news, friends, Jesus is here to meet you, to give you this new life, to give you this beautiful life of freedom and liberty to rebuild the walls again and remember the walls were meant to guard 
and to provide glory. Guarding the city and strong walls, fortified walls, meant there was glory around that city. When Christ comes and gives us new life, he builds us a wall in the sense that he gives us a guard and his name is the Holy Spirit. And our calling as a believer is to bring God glory. Always to make him known. So this Jesus is here for you. This Jesus is saying, if you're tired and if you're weary, come to me so that we can be the people of God who are not being picked off by the enemy, but are overcoming the enemy and his attacks. Let's pray this morning. Father, we love you. And we sense, God, that your presence is here with us even now in this moment. And God, we're asking that you would continue to show us in our life where there is hurt, show us in our life where there is pain and sin. And Father, would you begin to heal? Would you begin to mend and rebuild? Father, I pray for anybody who might be here or watching right now, God, that doesn't know you. We pray, Father, that they would place their trust in you right now in this moment as you are beckoning them home. Holy Spirit, would you illuminate their hearts to the beauty of the gospel in this moment? And we ask you, Father, that you would continue to help us to be a people who move forward on spiritual disciplines. Holy Spirit, we need your strength to be a people who are battle ready and a people who are ready to build together. And I pray that as we become this community knitted together by your power, by your strength, by your Holy Spirit, God, that we would be a shining light and we would begin to see spiritual renewal not only in our hearts, but Father, in our city. We love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stay? Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to this message. I pray that it was an encouragement to you and that you were challenged to grow deeper in your faith. Hey, do us a favor, real quick, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. It's a great way for you to stay connected to weekly content just like this, and you'll get notified when we go live on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. And if you're in the Houston area and you're looking for a community to belong to, we'd love to have you. Join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. right here at Oak Ridge High School. And lastly, I want to say thank you for your generosity. Because of it, we're able to provide content like this so that the gospel can be proclaimed in our city. Thank you so much for tuning in. We love you.